I'm going to talk about real-time machine learning, by which I mean real-time deployment or real-time predictive scoring, and why it's necessary in order to tap the greatest opportunities machine learning has to offer. Welcome to the Dr. Data Show. This is Eric Siegel, and here's the pressing question. So to optimize your largest scale operations with machine learning, you've got to deploy a model into real-time mission critical systems. Because, you know, after all, your largest operations are the highest frequency operations. Velocity means volume. You know, the processes that happen with the highest frequency are the most abundant. It's the greatest scale uh, opportunity for improvement. So how do you manage the risk of making that kind of a change to mission, mission critical systems by introducing a model scoring step? And perhaps more to the point, a less technical but more difficult question to answer, how do you push it through, push that change through? How do you get that change to a mission critical system greenlit, approved by the powers that be, right? After all, we have human nature. The larger the scale, the larger the, the higher the stakes, the greater the fear and resistance to that kind of change. And because of that, indeed, organizations often miss the greatest opportunities machine learning has to offer. So to set some context, in 20 seconds, here's why machine learning fundamentally is so important. Business needs prediction. Prediction requires machine learning. And machine learning relies on data. Putting that in reverse, we have data, we give it to machine learning, it generates models that predict. And those predictions improve all the main things we do, all the large-scale operations that make the world go around. In so doing, machine learning boosts sales, cuts costs, combats risk, prevents fraud, fortifies healthcare, streamlines manufacturing, conquers spam, and wins elections. So in this episode, I'll focus specifically on fraud detection as an example where in some cases we require real-time deployment and more generally talk about why indeed real-time scoring is often a business imperative and why the prediction effect relies on it. And number two, why it's feasible. The basic um, ingredients um, that make it possible to actually do this and at the same time manage any potential operational risk. And then finally, we'll talk about a running theme through the Dr. Data Show, which is the leadership component. That is why someone's got to take command. And that's going to be you, or if not you, on some level, you need to make sure someone takes the right kind of command over the organizational process that oversees this type of endeavor and the change management component of it. So deployment is so often where things go terribly wrong because deployment just doesn't happen. Right, The excitement, the focus today is mostly on machine learning methods, machine learning algorithms that, that, that produce that predictive model from input. But the main event is not the rocket science that creates the model. The main event is its actual deployment. It's actually use. That's where value is actually realized. But that's also where change has to actually be made in existing operations as an organization. So it's not the rocket science part, but... Um, neither is launching a rocket literally, right? Which is more exciting, the launch of the rocket or the, de- the design and development of that rocket in the first place? The main event is the launch of a predictive model into existing operations. And when we're talking about real time, that's both mo- even more exciting and potentially valuable, but also even that much more foreboding and can have that many more psychological impediments to getting it greenlit. So we'll talk about that, but let's dive a bit more into a specific example. We'll look at credit card fraud detection. 
um, as far as where real-time deployment's actually needed. Um, and, and then we'll get a bit more into the sort of feasibility of that deployment and um, the overcoming those um, organizational barriers. So now, in some cases, you don't need real-time deployment. Um, and to clarify, I'm talking not about the actual development of the model, the machine learning algorithm itself, that's very rarely done in real time. The sort of continuous updating of a model, um, typically you don't need to do that in real time. Um, but the, where value often requires real time is in, in the deployment, in the launch, in the way that model that's already been developed offline now is producing scores and those scores in real time are having an effect, right? So credit card fraud detection, I'll, you know, there's other places, plenty of online cases where you've got um, web behavior, online ad selection. You better pick an ad that's customized for that customer very quickly so that there's no latency from the uh, user experience. Um, also in automated trading. There's other places where you don't have that kind of sensitivity to, to real time. So in typical direct marketing, it can be done in batch. The actual scoring process um, prioritizing, ordering, and selecting which customers are going to receive direct mail, for example. These kinds of decisions are done offline, can be done in batch. Other kinds of fraud detection besides credit card fraud, for example, fr check fraud, invoice fraud, oftentimes can be done in a batch process. Um, processing of applications such as uh, insurance claims, um, an application for a new credit card, um, other kinds of claims processing. Um, but when it comes to credit card fra uh, fraud detection in particular, the thing is, is that, you know, the person's um, conducting the transac trans transaction, the end customer, and whether they're at a merchant in person or they're doing it on the internet, that transaction's generally going to go through immediately. So if you're going to block it by way of a, a fraud detection model, it's got to happen right at the moment of transaction. This is a big deal. It turns out that in 2019, estimated worldwide losses due to credit card fraud were more than $28 billion, with a projected increase of a billion more worth of losses each year. So what you do, like any other predictive modeling task, you've got historical data, what did and did not turn out to be fraudulent, um, even if it was discovered too late. Um, you take that data and generate a predictive model that can now score a, a current transaction based on the information about the um, cardholder and the particular transaction and you know, produce a predictive score, the probability. What are the chances that this is likely to be, uh, what are the chances that this is a fraudulent um, transaction? It should not be authorized. So whatever method is making this determination is essentially estimating the probability of how likely this is to be fraud. Um, you know, whether it was produced from machine learning or it's handwritten rules or some combination, it, it doesn't matter. The principle is the same. And no such method is a perfect crystal ball. It can't predict correctly for every ca case. So it's going to make errors. It's going to get a lot of cases wrong. The value comes from predicting and labeling better than guessing. And that lift, that predictive multiplier, the ability to, to, to eke out, for example, this 5% of all transactions are three times more likely than average to be fraudulent, still may only be less than a percent chance they're fraudulent, but much more likely than average. That's the kind of thing that, that can um, um, serve very well. And that predictive lift um, makes the prediction effect possible. So the prediction effect is that a little prediction goes a long way. Predicting better than guessing delivers value. So if you have somebody inspecting transactions to see whether they're um, fraudulent, an auditor, and you're delivering to that human um, a workload of transactions that are much more likely than average to be fraudulent, then that auditor's time is going to be spent a lot more effectively, a lot more efficiently. If you're giving them um, transactions four times more 
likely than average to be fraud, then their time is literally being spent four times more effectively. And for every day that they spend auditing transactions, they'll deliver four times more actual fraud um, than they would if you just gave them um, a random selection of transactions. That's what the multiplier is. It's called lift. And that's what makes that prediction effect possible. Now, in the case of credit card fraud detection, though, we're not talking about the value from an auditor, although that can be part of the process further down the line. But in terms of real time at the moment of transaction, this isn't decision support, supporting a human's decision. This is decision automation. The system's going to decide whether to authorize a transaction or whether it should at least temporarily be held in the moment pending further authorization or what have you. Now, if that's a false flag, a false positive, right? If it's a if it's a legitimate transaction and the end user um, gets interrupted, that that disruption is costly to you know it's not this isn't good for anybody. That cardholder will be disrupted, inconvenienced. Um, maybe they'll dig out a different credit card from their wallet, or if it happens too often, they'll give up on the credit card entirely. Um, but the other kind of um, error rather than a false positive would be a false negative where it actually was fraudulent, but the system missed it. It was not flagged automatically as fraud. In real time, the the transaction went through. And if um, so, the opportunity was lost and the criminal got away with their contraband, right? So they say crime doesn't pay. But without real-time machine learning to do fraud detection, actually crime does pay. They get away with the contraband. So those two kinds of errors, false positives and false negatives, every system is going to make some of those errors. The question sort of is, what's the balance between the two? And it's a business decision sort of how to, sort of, how to um, strike the balance between the two. But one way or another, you're facing a trade-off. So, for example, if the system is is tuned to more aggressively find fraud and it's going to be flagging transactions as fraudulent more often, it will indeed catch more fraud, but it will also incur more false flags, false positives, that many more unnecessary um, or at least incorrect disruptions to the end cardholder. So that's a tough balance to strike. The value we get with machine learning that improves whatever legacy existing system for fraud detection may exist is to improve that trade-off. So this is the value of machine learning when it comes to real-time decision automation. We get a better trade-off. So for example, we might be able to increase that aggressiveness and capture more fraud without incurring more false flags. So that's that's where the need comes comes in place. Now, sometimes decision makers say, "Well, wait, you know, this is too much of a load on a real time system. Um, we can't uh, score all the transactions. Let's just pick some subset of transactions, transactions in a certain region, or a random subset, or something like that. Only selectively score some." By doing that, all you're doing is compromising the value of the system and you're incurring more false negatives. I mean, anything that you don't detect in real time, it's too late. They got away with the contraband. The transaction went through. Um, Downstream detection that is not real time, that maybe happens later the next day or the next week, again, it happens too late. So this is just the nature of the beast. These transactions are happening in real time. Now, it, it, um, it turns out that you have uh, this kind of analysis paralysis. So you can kind of imagine an executive like a deer in headlights. You know, you say, hey, you know, the greatest opportunities are the ones we're most likely to miss. They got to do real time. We got to make a change to this um, mission critical real time system to tap the prediction effect. We need real time scoring. And you'll get pushback. The you can't afford the, ch- the cost of introducing a new step to every transaction. You can't afford the risk that it'll slow down the process, that it'll somehow disrupt or compromise that mission-critical system. But here's the bottom line. You actually can't afford not to do this. 
by not moving forward with real-time predictive scoring, you're incurring a severe opportunity cost, right? The, the prediction effect is, means that you're going to have value from doing this. And in fact, you jeopardize your competitive stronghold because this is where the industry is moving. So it's really not a question of whether, but a question of when and whether you'll indeed uh, get that um, in place before a competitor. So let's talk for a moment about what makes this feasible. Um, In general, as we mentioned, there's two phases, right? There's the model generation, which is typically offline and not continuous or real time. And then secondarily, there's the use of that model to produce scores. The modeling is where there's more of a time bottleneck. The actual creation of the model, learning from a large amount of data, historical data, that can take time. It may only take literally a few minutes once all the ducks are aligned, but that's way too slow Um, for a real-time system. Um, Whereas the scoring, the actual use of that model, where you now look at an individual, in this case, credit card transaction, everything known about the cardholder and the particulars of that uh, um, requested purchase, um, that's input to the model that's been generated. And the model itself is typically extremely quick to execute. It's exactly what computers have been designed to do really fast. Models typically don't have loops. They can be somewhat intricate. They could be a soup of mathematics. But to take the inputs, churn out that math, and then output a probability, which is what the model does, that's typically very fast. It's fast enough that you can indeed introduce it into a real-time system. So there's basically two rules of thumb to make all of this feasible. One is... Don't use any real-time mission-critical operational system for the model training, the machine learning part itself, the generation of the model. Um, And then when it comes to actually scoring the model in real-time, in fact, yes, uh, um, introduce that into your existing operational system. Because the the system that you have now is already a high-performance system. If you're already doing real-time transactions... Even if it's not a predictive score worked into that system, you already have a system that's streamlined, engineered, developed, and put in place to be doing these things in real time. So it more often than not is feasible to introduce what can be a relatively lightweight additional step for each transaction, which is to um, apply the model, you know, calculate that probability, the predictive score, and then use it to make some determination about whether um, what might end up being a block on the otherwise immediate authorization on a transaction. Now, as far as real-time systems, um, as somewhat of an aside, you may be using a mainframe. Organizations that do large-scale real-time operations are often using mainframes. Now, For those not in the know, mainframes are often misunderstood to be legacy technology, but in fact, uh, they're not old school whatsoever. Mainframes never stopped advancing, and they are designed for high-velocity operations and to have an exceptionally low system downside. So they're very much still alive. They may be the way you're already doing real-time operations, and therefore they may be the platform on which you actually deploy the model. Um, It turns out that 92 of the top 100 banks are using mainframes. Um, $7 trillion in annual visa payments are done on mainframes. 23 of the top 25 retailers use mainframes. All top 10 insurers use mainframes. and uh, mainframes execute 30 billion transactions a day, including 90% of all credit card transactions. So the front runner of mainframes is IBM. They're IBM Z systems, um, and uh, 71% of Fortune 500 companies run core business functions with an IBM Z system. And indeed, IBM sponsored an article I wrote um, it's actually a bit more detailed than what I have time to cover today, 
on real-time machine learning. The article I will link to from the podcast episode description, um, it is entitled Real-Time Machine Learning, Why It's Vital and How to Do It. You can, uh, if you Google real-time machine learning, it comes on the first page of results, or you can Google real-time machine learning, machine learning times, that's where it's published. So you could Google real-time machine learning, machine learning times, or if you just Google real-time machine learning times with a little less redundancy, or just click on the link I'll put in the podcast um, description. So that article um, covers uh, the concepts I'm covering today and then has links to sort of back up a lot of the facts and figures and concepts um, that I've been covering. So let's talk, go back to the sort of decision-making um, process. The resistance to deployment is sort of uncanny, but it's also, you know, not being um, addressed in a very direct way. Right now, the industry of machine learning is nascent, not technologically, but psychologically. Everyone's happy to be focusing on this amazing rocket science type technology, which is exciting to me too, and that's very much why. Um, I got into machine learning originally um, back in uh, 1992, essentially. Um, But by focusing just on that, there's not nearly as much focus on the actual um, deployment, the actual launch. And that's a big deal. And it's a major psychological um, shift that needs to take place. Um, You can't just... uh, Focus on the technology and assume that there'll be value. You've got to uh, actually deploy it. So the machine learning kind of leadership practice that makes this happen has to take on not just putting together all the technical components and steps and getting the right data and the right data scientists and the, and the right roles. and It also has to deal with the organization as a whole, as far as who are the decision makers, who are are the managers at the line of business, where the operation is actually going to change. Do they understand what's going on? Are they willing to green light it? Specifically, do they understand the measure of performance, the lift or other measure of performance, both of the model itself, how well does it predict, how much better than guessing, and the performance measure on sort of in business terms, including ROI, or profit or something like that um, that's pertinent and how much do we expect that that'll potentially Im- improve with deployment. Sort of the just the correct arithmetic that people who otherwise might not want to pay attention to the detail actually need to pay attention to the detail, need to put it in terms of KPIs, key performance indicators, um, get them on board. So that leadership practice, you know, essentially is not rocket science at all. It's just that the rocket scientists don't pay any attention to it. But let me give you a real quick rundown of what it is. There's six steps. Um, You define the business objective, number one. So I want to decrease fraud. You define the prediction objective to to that end. So what do I want my model to output? Well, I want to output a probability for each transaction, that the transaction is uh, actually fraudulent. Um, Number three, prep the data. That's a very big technical step um, that's very particular to to the business objective by way of the prediction objective. But it means pulling together the right historical data and putting it into the right form and format. And that's a topic for another day, but data preparation is a huge part of this process. Much bigger, in fact, than the actual rocket science part. So the applying machine learning, the training of the model, um, that's more than often um, uh, a much shorter lived, even even if requiring higher expertise, part of the process than the data preparation. And then the deployment. Now, deployment is a technical step. You do need to get that model out into the field. It needs to be integrated. It's, it needs to be invoked or called upon. And then the pro- probability 
i.e. predictive score that it outputs need to be integrated into the existing operation. That's a technical endeavor. But deployment isn't is a technical endeavor in order to achieve a business result. It's a change to an existing biz, major business operation. Um, so getting the understanding of what's going to take place there um, by decision makers and managers and executives and the whole organization is absolutely key. And then the, the last of these six steps is to evaluate the model after deployment and, and keep monitoring it and maintaining it. So, again, when you're talking about a real-time deployment, it ups the ante. So it's, the stakes are higher, the potential win is higher, the opportunity is higher, but there can be that much more resistance to change. There can be that much more, um, many more hoops to jump through, that much more need to take a step back before the whole project even begins and make sure that the whole organization's on board and there's a universal understanding of the what and the why and the how much, the measurements of performance. So we've got a couple questions here from listeners. Uh, let's, let's go to the first question here. My models serve a purpose, but management usually gets in the way. I don't understand the resistance. Don't companies want to improve? Oh, she's the AI asking the question sounded a little disappointed. She said her models serve a purpose. Why is management always getting in the way? I don't understand the resistance. You know, I feel for the AI. Um, so let me put what I've been saying another way. Um, the fact is... The sad, lonely fact for the misunderstood data scientist is that the value, the sort of no-brainer value proposition of actually making use of the model that you've generated is not nearly as self-evident to the powers that be as it is to you. From your perspective, as a data scientist, it seems super clear, I mean... It's not the rocket science part. It, 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 it's, uh, you know, it almost goes without saying. But from the decision maker, um, from their perspective, you're talking about change to the largest scale operation that has been put into place over a lot of time and on which the entire business is, is depending. So there is risk to any change, whether it's mathematically, quantitatively, scientifically motivated or otherwise. Whatever the change is, there's already immediately going to be a lot of consternation about the risk of making that change. Is it really necessary? You're talking about um, introducing an entrepreneurial spirit within an established organization. So there's automatically this kind of culture gap. The um, socializing of the concept itself is as much a part of the process as the number crunching, which is a sad state of affairs because typically a person who's into number crunching isn't necessarily into the right kind of socializing, right? So we have this culture gap, we have this dilemma, and the only answer is to have somebody taking on the right leadership role where they're bridging that culture gap. And let's go. Like we've got one other question. Let's go to this other question that came in from another one of our artificial intelligence listeners. Why doesn't the modeling stage take place in real time? Why doesn't the modeling take place in real time? We've been talking about the deployment, the scoring, the use of the model happening on the fly, at the time of transaction, at the moment of interaction with an end user or what have you. Why not also the actual (laughs) rocket science itself? Why not the learning process? Um, The fact is that uh, you just typically, it's just not worth it. It's almost never done across machine learning projects. It's just not really necessary. And the the complexity to actually do that 
It's so high compared to whatever possible value there is. The bottom line is that if you incremental or sorry, if you periodically update a model over, you know, refresh it over more recent data and allow for that to be an offline process so there can be expert data scientists, human oversight on it, um, that's good enough. So maybe a day a week, a month, a quarter goes by. It depends on the deployment context, on the business application, how the model's being used. It depends on how you witness its performance degrade over time. But whatever the frequency is, it's not moment to moment. But that loss of quickly updating is very slight compared to what you would have to pay in complexity to actually put a system into place so that the model is being refreshed in a fully automated way. Because if it's continuously being updated, that makes it automatic. But traditionally and typically, the actual modeling process is done um, manually. There's oversight. You know, modeling at the core is automatic. It's an algorithm. It's software. You push the button. It's a PhD tool. Push here, dummy. Um, it's not being done by hand by a human, but sort of setting up the new data for it, um, seeing what it spits out in the way of a model and understanding the performance of the model, validating, debugging, um, that's manual. So there's human oversight on that process. And the idea of getting it fully automated um, is applicable very rarely and just typically not necessarily worth it. So to conclude about real-time deployment, um, the greatest opportunities, by definition, because these are the ones that approach the largest scale operations, for machine learning are in real-time deployment. Other kinds of deployment that are offline for all kinds of other business operations are also extremely valuable and may be the first thing to tackle or may be a most a more important thing for some organizations. But in general... The largest operations are the things that happen the most quickly. But the only way to make any of these things happen is to take command or ensure that someone else is taking the right command and that the right leadership practice, the right organizational management practice is in place holistically, not just a technical endeavor. This is a change to operations, so it's an organizational endeavor. So let me put it this way. If pure apprehension is precluding your company from pursuing the greatest value propositions machine learning has to offer, then your business is getting in the way of doing business.